Hello, I'm Sally Kanat. Welcome to the studio. Good evening. I'm a little bit late, but better late than never, I guess. Well, maybe some people might think the opposite. I didn't. Yeah, I didn't put plastic back on. What did I? I did. It was plastic. Well, that's something for after the stream, but now I'm intrigued. Hmm. Looks like I've had scythe. Now that I can just... Hmm. That is weird. I tidied things up yesterday. I did a lot of stuff yesterday. And the plastic that goes over there has obviously got thrown away. That's not good. That's not good at all. I'm just looking around my, my desk here just to see if I can find it. Because it's there for a purpose. Which is to, you know, keep that clean. And um, um, it's not here, which is decidedly weird. I can't see even why I throw it away, but it appears to have vanished. Hmm. Uh, yeah, that sort of thing is going to bug me all evening. So, hmm, today. Today I've been doing some work on the 3D printer. Not a lot, and I need to get the soldering iron out now to do the heated bed, but it's moving a little bit closer to being finished. At least small amount now. Let me get on with this because otherwise I'll stand here talking all evening. I keep finding magic dots, little magic dots. Uh, as I was clearing the desk yesterday in order to do some of the printing and just put, generally put things away. I hate having things too untidy. I know there's a load of stuff down there before somebody says, but um, it gradually is being moved away. I have no idea what number this is. I think it's number five. That's number six, so it must be number five. Mm. Okay. So, um, yeah, number five. So yesterday was an interesting stream, playing with the, f the model flight simulators. This was. I enjoyed it. Only thing about broadcasting it on Twitch was the fact that it doesn't have a game category. <laughs> Neither of them did, so. But I had fun. And it's been a while since I've uh, uh, played with those simulators. And. Uh, I always used to enjoy slop so well I did much of it but I used to enjoy it and the uh, the simulator I always find really relaxing to fly uh, which it not <laughs> which it kind of isn't in real life because as you if you were watching yesterday you have seen all the problems in trying to land it's a bit easier when you've got a field behind you as opposed to being right on the top of a hill. Um, in fact, it's a lot easier, but you don't always have that situation.
but I do need to uh, practice nose in flying with the helicopter that way I can then fly any way around because at the moment I can really only fly the helicopters tailing hovering wise and the flying in theory you can fly in light planes and I can fly some planes I was a, a beginner flyer of planes so you start with when you model flying this if you're intelligent you start with training aircraft which are uh, what they call three control or three three channel so you have a motor you have a pitch control which is elevator and you have a rudder which is your control or the roll control which might seem odd but the wing shape means that when you move the tail it banks and that's how the planes turn by banking um, and a rudder only is easier to fly because the planes themselves at that point are st um, self-stable they're highly stable. You let go of the controls, they right themselves and start flying straight, no matter what direction they were in just beforehand. Including upside down, pointy straight up in the air, whatever. You let go of controls on, on the three channel trainers and they right themselves. What you do then is you progress to four channels, which is aliens. Um, but I can I can fly or could fly four channel trainers um, when I last uh, last flew a real model uh, aircraft. Which is so many years ago, but it's kind of like what the what they say: ride a bike. You never forget how to ride a bike. You just have to re-practice a little bit sometimes. And it's a bit like that with a model aircraft. So I can I can do things like fly upside down, fly towards myself, myself which are where the controls are effectively. The controls aren't actually inverted, they just feel like they are. And you end up, well, you either end up just doing it, which is probably what, or you start imagining yourself in the cockpit and then the controls are natural. But it is kind of a skill you have to learn to. It's upside down, it's coming towards you. Everything's the opposite to what you think it is. Only for some reason I can't do that with the helicopter. <laughs> Possibly um, just because it's um, somewhat more expensive. That's probably what it is. Because when you're sort of 150 feet in the air with a model plane, and it's upside down, you lose orientation, you can get it back. You either just take your hands off the control and uh, being a train it writes itself, um, or you, uh, you literally just you know, work at it until you know which way up it is and correct it. But with a helicopter that's hovering four feet off the ground uh, and you have it facing towards you and you get the controls wrong, you don't have time. Now you could obviously fly 150 feet in the air, then you'd have time. It's just 150 feet in the air with a hovering helicopter is quite difficult to see. That's why the simulator is so good. But today we're back to doing this. I'm not, don't know if anybody actually liked watching them uh, with the simulators being flown. I know the stats said a few people dropped in, didn't stay very long. But uh, so 
So yesterday was a day of reconfiguring, reconfiguring things like the stream deck here and changing changing the icons so that when I'm broadcasting for example the one that says I'm broadcasting lights up bright green the one that says if I'm recording lights up bright green if I'm not they go red but interestingly the scene and selected scene goes red instead of being no colour so my, my stream deck is quite colourful but I find it easy just to glance over now and I can tell uh, at a glance, which scene I'm showing, because it's the only one that's red, and whether I'm broadcasting, whether the mic's live. Hello, yesterday, that wasn't working. Uh, plus, I accidentally misconfigured the completely wrong thing when I was doing it. It is slightly confusing when you don't play with OBS too much. You end, yeah, if you're not careful, you end up sort of editing completely the wrong thing, as I did. But to edit it again and put it all back. Ah, but I'll learn a bit more about OBS that way. I also learned I need to get I need to get a light on the front of this camera. <laughs> um, that would be the best thing. A light on the front of this camera. Uh, then, when it's set over there as it was last night, I'd have a light in my, I'd have a light in my face. But in my face would be lit up because I couldn't put the face cam on yesterday. I couldn't put it on my face yesterday just because it's too dark. Which I knew in the afternoon and then completely forgot. Mm. Still looking at the models and the scenery was uh, a lot more fun than looking at my face. Now there's a hair on here. Let's see if we can get that off. That's the, one of the reasons for having the, uh, the plastic. Where did it go? I do not recall throwing it away. Oh, well, it's not here. So today I, yeah, well, not not exactly associated, but one of the things about if I get the 3D printer working is I'll be able to make a mount for this uh, camera to carry a ring light. And what I'll have to do is probably from somewhere like Adafruit or the UK distributors, they've got um, a ring of LEDs. No, actually, tricolor LEDs. Which means I'll be able to vary the colour tone if I really want it to. But um, yeah, I'll be able to mount them around the camera. Ring lights are quite good for cameras because they, you don't get reflections and things like that as. Uh, in the same way. If I get the if I get the printer finished, I'll be able to make a a mount for a ring light or a ring light, and then when I can afford to buy the LEDs, and I'll be able to uh, to light it up, which actually will be a lot better for things like this because the lighting will be a lot more even because it'll be coming from the camera. So what do I do today with a 3D printer? Uh, yeah the Z axis, I mounted the Z, the Z axis uh, control rods, put them onto the stepper motors and aligned the X axis. Yep, so it's the same height on both sides so it's, uh, it, it goes up so it's level all the way across basically, uh, which is always a good thing because that way then you don't squash or damage your print as you go across it. And I put the x-axis carriage belt on and fasten that, that was a bit fiddle. And now I'm working on the bed. So uh, it has a heated bed 
nice, uh, nice, uh, I'm going to say LED, fidget circuit there, and I now need to solder an LED and a resistor on it, uh, which shows you when the bed's being heated, and then solder on the wires for, uh, for the bed's power supply. I can then mount the bed, and we're another stage closer. But uh, this is this is the point where I have to get the soldering iron out. So I didn't do that earlier tonight. Shall maybe save that all tomorrow. Get some more of these in. Number five. Is that number five? It is. This is possible. No, that's a password. Yes, because you don't have any surface mount LEDs and resistors because they'd uh, go really nicely on that board. But we'll do it the other way. We'll do it the old fashioned way. The actual leads. I've also figured out something about Twitter as well. I've worked it out. Bit of research. If anybody was watching who streams um, and tweets, why is my CPU set at 100%? Probably because of that. Let's just drop that out. Not a lot, probably because that's the scene I'm actually broadcasting. So I just noticed something then on OBS, it was uh, the PC was running at 100% CPU. Um, which is fine, it will handle it. Uh, the cooling wasn't spinning up or anything, so um, water cooling was doing its job. But one of the things I was doing uh, is I've got three monitors, so I have the main. In fact, I don't normally monitor the CPU usage, I don't know why that's on the display. But I have the main OBS on the centre window. And I have uh, had the outgoing thing that you're seeing also on my right hand monitor because it's bigger than the OBS window. I know I can open the, make the OBS window bigger and I know I can undock the display and things like that, but 
it's just easier just to project it. But I was I had this camera view, uh, specifically just the view from that camera on the other monitor, and that seemed to be taking quite a bit of CPU, probably because it's processing the image uh, two or well, three, uh, three different ways, I guess. The outgoing image, which is on the RBS window, plus what it was projecting, plus this camera only, which is the main part of the outgoing stream on the other monitor. That seemed to stress the CPU a bit. So I've just killed one of the projections. Didn't don't really need to see just the one camera view. It was it was nice because it's it's nice to see what exactly this one camera is seeing without any of the overlays and things, but not uh, not a 50% CPU, extra CPU. One of these days there will be a new PC on the cards. Probably keep the same case though. Probably keep the same power supply given it's a 1200 watt power supply, modular power supply. Um, I even guess I'll probably keep all the cables since they're all specially made for this case. And just replace all the electronics motherboard and uh, actually be what would it be? Be the motherboard and the graphics card. Yeah, that's about all that's in it. Um, using onboard sound because I don't really need the surround sound. Um, which it has on board anyway, but I don't really need um, high fidelity sound and things. Don't play games or stuff that need it. Uh, I'm just thinking I've got a USB 3 card in there, which might be of some use. And the thing is, yeah, what I probably want to do then is. Um, Put this current, if I bought new, put this current motherboard and graphics card into another case because it's a powerful enough machine as it stands. So it would be a, a real shame to throw it out. I could use it quite easily. It could just be something like a streaming PC, that would be an interesting concept. Except of course, well yeah, hmm. yes it could be dedicated to streaming. Oh, it's certainly powerful enough to, uh, to run uh, as a virtual cloud server. Too many good machines. <laughs> too good to throw away and yet too good. Um, uh, too good to keep in a way. Most of the servers I, I'm running on a. Is it a Pentium? I found what the server runs at. It's, too, it's got two cores, so. Well, this one's got four. But um, it's a bit overkill running a four four core machine on the virtual server when I don't actually even load the current server up with two cores. I've forgotten how old this machine is now. The time I got it, it was state of the art ish. Without going to really stupendously silly money. But it was just about the um, the top of the range video card at the time. <laughs> oh dear. 
uh, you know, several, like sort of several hundred pounds worth of video card, uh, which is now water cooled. Because uh, I remember taking that heatsink off uh, to put the water cool water cool on, it was a little bit nerve wracking. You know, when you sort of uh, cracking up the six hundred pound um, CPU um, GPU, because if it because I couldn't test it because, yeah, I suppose what I should have, thinking about it originally, what I should have done was build the, build the whole PC air-cooled with a stock cooler and make sure the cards worked and then uh, uh, ripped it all apart again. But, yeah, and I suppose technically I could have done the water cooling uh, what you know, close the loop early rather than putting the graphics card on it and then tested it because I was thinking I remember thinking at the time if this doesn't work and I've just ripped the CPU or uh, the, the heatsink off the GPU I've potentially lost a lot of money but it has worked for quite a long time several years so it's one of the advantages of getting um, saving and getting you know, the best you can afford in, in some ways. At least it lasts longer. I mean, I know the GPU what handles some of the things these days. Some of the uh, graphics. It what hand, it certainly what handles something like an Oculus Rift, for example. But it still doesn't do too bad in, in many games, even running some of them at, at high resolutions. But having said which, I don't run a lot of the FPSs and things like that that people do these days. But I tend to run simulators. And even things like Euro Truck and stuff like that, which um, use a fair bit of GPU. They still run okay. And I'm running the CPU at 2.4 gigahertz so it's not it's not like I'm running a 4 gigahertz um, CPU either although this one will overclock that far because I, I did at one point had it running at that for quite some uh, some time but I used to make um, DVDs so I would do video editing and things like that and I could actually Back then, I could um, I could encode video in better than real time with it overclocked, and I could uh, also write it to DVD in better than real time, uh, which is uh, was uh, quite a feat back then. But uh, so today, graphics card, and it, it, yeah, it's, it's what people would call laughable, I guess, compared to today's cards. But one of the interesting things is potentially I could just go and get a new graphics card, like a 1080 for example, and put it in. And the, the um, CPU would have a decent chance of keeping up with it. And I could overclock it as well. I may even still have the overclocking settings I was using. I stopped overclocking and put it back to standard because I just wasn't using it most of the time. It was sat. It was uh, idled. <laughs> And of course, it was just um, just heating the room then most of the time because when you overclock it, it runs warmer, so the cooling has to run a bit more. But it was, uh, um, I guess, these days. I'd notice it most on um, coal painter when you try and do things like uh, rotate the display because it hesitates and thinks about it, and that's. A little bit of a pain. That'd be one of the reasons why I wanted to get would want to get a new C, a new GPU. 
and have a CPU that will keep up with it. The other one is I kind of liked it. I'd love to get something like an Oculus Rift. But there's not many games I want to play um, with it. I mean, one of them is Euro Truck Simulator. Which in a way is kind of weird, because with the three monitors, I can uh, I can have a, a, a full truck width with the three monitors. So I've got sort of better than virtual reality, I suppose, or different in that I can look left and look right and look in the mirrors because of using the three monitors. Which is a completely different experience to using track IR. Another thing with that is you can't actually look behind you like you can with um, a virtual reality. Or sort of lean forward to look around the door pillar. Uh, or look down at your instruments and things like that, so that but uh, I'm kind of in a quandary in a way because one of the things I'd love to be able to do, or well, potentially I can do, part of, the, well, part of the plans for the 3D printer is to actually build um, a console for, for the truck simulator so that. I've got the uh, what was that? G25, G23, the earlier wheel anyway, uh, the Logitech wheel. And one of the things I kind of wanted to be able to do with that is to put in quotes real instruments around it. So things like a real indicator stock rather than pushing a button on the thing on the on the. Uh, on the wheel, to have a real indicator stock, uh, put you know real light stock or yeah you know, light stock I suppose on there. Um, put real you know have a console with a real light switch on it or a real uh, wiper switch on it or you know maybe even a real ignition key. Hydraulic brake, uh, hydraulic um, brake lever, that sort of thing. Um, so that you actually simulate in a smaller than normal area but simulate a console so that you don't have to mess about with all of these controls you know like when if you go if you use for example any of the switches on the wheel for um, say the indicators it's kind of hard when you're turning to do the indicators but in a real vehicle it's on the stock and it's always in the same place so you can just flick it, flick it and I'd kind of like to be able to replicate that and do things like put the uh, range and splitter switch on the uh, on the actual gear lever. I know you can buy them, but they're um, not, cheap. not cheap. And essentially, it is just a switch, uh, a very sort of inexpensive switch in some ways few pounds at most uh, and something like an Arduino would then c uh, connect it to uh, the PC um, so relatively inexpensive it then just becomes a case of uh, a mount t uh, to the existing G27 wheel you know it's a G27 isn't it yeah. uh, which the 3D printer is really good at but of course when you've got all these things are nice, and of course you can then look down to flip a switch or whatever you want the lights on or you want the wipers on or whatever else you can put on the switches that I can't remember these days. I know you use more than the eight switches on the um, steering wheel, plus the two flappy paddles. Uh, and then you've got all the switches I suppose because you're talking about things like the decoupler and uh, stuff like that, which is uh, I usually have on the switches above the um, on the gear lever console. But of course, one of the things is if you if you go to like an Oculus Rift, you can't see them. So there's partly a thing in that you know, an indicator stock is in the right position even with the Oculus Rift you 
whilst it doesn't look right you can at least feel it I suppose but um, so I don't know, two minds Well, having said which, for for just something like that, and uh, just for the one game, for example, the Oculus Rift will be a little bit of an extravagance. No, let's not kid ourselves. It would be a lot of an extravagance. And I do have another uh, adventure game, Cyan game, that I'd love to see in Oculus Rift. But um, again, it's, it's kind of overkill, expensive for what it is. Don't stop me wanting it, but I'm going to have to sell a lot of jewellery or a lot of um, art to be able to afford something like that. Or maybe glasswork if I like the glasswork. That's becoming a little bit more closer to reality now. Here's glass. Not there yet, but hopefully, I am hoping, we'll soon be in a position where I will be able to book the one day taster um, trial. Last work trial and see whether I actually like it or not. I like it enough to want to learn to be able to do it. So I would uh, certainly be looking to do that commercially though because it would need um, it would be an investment um, and it would need I'd need to keep buying glass and stuff. But I'm not going to get too excited about that until I actually get to be able to book it, which one isn't yet. And it doesn't happen, isn't happening until I actually get the thing booked. And as that relies on something else happening, <laughs> that isn't even getting booked just yet. Oh yes, I was I got distracted, didn't I? I don't know what by, maybe the plastic. Um Twitter. If you're a streamer and you tweet and you include your URL for the stream. You might have noticed that Twitter puts um sort of a banner up which is sort of generally has your logo channel icon in it and some information about the stream and uh, for long enough I've noticed that you know like tonight for example I'm doing magic dots but it might have said uh, you know 
carving with very sharp chisels, which is from about 30 streams ago. And I, for the life of me, couldn't work out why it was doing that. Uh, and I figured it was something to do with Twitter interacting with Twitch. It sort of is. I mean, I thought it was what Twitch was saying, so Twitch was giving it back old information. thought that for a long time, uh, but it's not. Twitch is actually giving back exactly the right time because what's it's doing, what um, Twitter is doing is it asks Twitch because it's a Twitch URL, it effectively goes to the Twitch page and grabs that you've given it in this particular case, grabs some information to display in that in the tweet. But what it's doing, is, as I discovered, is it caches it. It goes and gets it and then every... And I don't know how long it caches. But it essentially keeps reusing the same one. So as I'm a variety streamer and I keep changing what I'm doing, um, I noticed that um, it kept giving me out-of-date you know, out information. Um, because Twitter caches information it gets back from the web page that you've given it so I've discovered there is a page where you can uh, a Twitter page where if you put your the URL in that you want to use it goes away and comes back and says this is what it's gonna look like in a tweet so if you're developing a web page and you want to be able to tweet about it you can do your development you can look at how Twitter would tweet it out with you out you actually having to tweet it which of course you know, if you're doing development you don't want to be um, you know, publicly putting out bad tweets or, or putting out things with bad formatting and it doesn't make you look very good of course so um, Twitter do give you this ability to test what it will look like so when you develop your page you can put the right information on it that Twitter will read to build this thing, it's called a card. Um, and they have a card validator. Um, but the one thing about a card validator, or you know, for use in development things, is it's no good if it caches it, because you know, you're testing it, you want to make some changes, you want to see what the changes look like, not what the cache looked like 50 changes ago. So every time you try this in the validator, it clears Twitter's cache and shows you the most up-to-date information. Um, the point about that being, even though I'm not doing development, is it clears the cache. <laughs> so the next time you use the, the URL, or indeed if you try it in the validator, it goes and gets the information and caches the latest. So um, if you are, uh, have that problem, if you tweet include your URL and it's giving you wrong information um, do a search for the Twitter card validator and when you find I think it's something like cardvalidator.twitch.com or something like that I don't know um, put your URL in there and it will clear the cache and give you the latest up-to-date information which I will now probably have to do almost before I every stream because I keep changing my title uh, or I uh, yeah change crafts so I don't want it to say I'm doing magic dots when I'm doing something else completely so now part of the routine will be to fire uh, fire the URL at the card validator um, before every stream that's yet another thing added on to the pre-stream routine which is Check the cameras are both working. Check the microphone works, which usually involves unplugging it and plugging it back in again. It's only about USB. Uh, that it doesn't seem to want to uh, maintain the audio channel. Um, I'm hitting 100% CPU again. And uh, make sure that the stream title's correct. Make sure that the uh, categories are all correct. Make sure the microphone's not muted. Let me have a look at why this is at 100% again. What is it that's running?
Nothing. So when I start looking, it drops. That is suspicious. Let's pull that like that and have a look and see what happens when it does that again. I want to know what it is that's taking 35% of the CPU. Because OBS is running with about 50, which isn't bad, given that it's um, uh, scaling and down and uh, transcoding. What's taking the rest that's um, got me a little bit concerned. So, Friday night on Twitch, a really quiet night, always seems to be Friday, maybe Friday is not a good, a good night to stream, might have to consider taking Fridays off, this will give me the opportunity to get on with some other things. No, that's broken. Yep, we're still running about 80. That's fine. I could make it easier on OBS by doing things like running this camera at 720p rather than 1080. Um, same with this one. But, and then not down. Actually, I'm not sure I am still. Yeah, I think I'm broadcasting at 720. That was the original intention anyway, because even though I'm a an associate, um, I don't get transcode. <laughs> so, um, 1080p is a bit hard uh, for some phones and tablets, which would restrict the people, giving people the chance to watch me. <laughs> Not that they probably would even if they could, but um, if they if they can't, they definitely won't, so that's why I broadcast it. I should, I think, be broadcasting at, 10, uh, at 7.20. And I'm, I'm broadcasting about as fast as I reasonably can. Um, to keep a high quality output, but still allow phones and things to work. 
so I can't go for even though I could broadcast at higher bit rates, um, which probably would be better on the uh, on OBS uh, and on the bandwidth on the uh, CPU, but uh, without the transcodes. I'd be shooting myself in the foot. So whilst I've been wa working today, I've been watching a little bit of Fortress Craft Evolved. Which is a game I've got, I haven't played for about a year. In fact, it's gone through quite a lot of developments and I haven't yet got the uh, Frozen Factory expansion pack for it. Um, which I will we'll get at some point in the future, but just not yet. But I've kind of been looking at that thinking I'd like to play that again. In odd moments at the moment, I'm playing um, Factorio in quite an unusual way because I'm playing it Mega Base style without having got to Mega Base. So at the moment, it's, it's the map is I'm using the large area of the map. Everything's connected by trains. You know, there's smelting going on in one place, copper smelting in another. Um, steel making in another, green circuit making in another, red and so on. It's um, in fact my main boss, I do have a main boss. Uh, it's got the make anything group of machines on it and that's about it at the moment. Um, so my main boss is kind of almost completely pointless. Um, I think I'll be using it to assemble the, the final, which is what yellow, yellow science, I think. And uh, possibly the rocket parts. Now then, I'm looking to see if there's any more number five on here before I tip what's in that bowl away and I start with the number six. I'm not seeing any. It doesn't mean there won't be any. Because around these number sixes, it's quite hard to see. Five and six are so similar, both in sort of the shape and in the colour that they've used. Mind you, what I'd probably end up doing if I saw one whilst I'm using the number six is because it'll just be a single one is I probably won't bother I'll just over stick a number six in there. So we'll switch out in a second to the number six, yeah. I'll tip these away, no point in keeping them. So let's see if there's anybody out there. No, I'm talking to myself. Oh, right. Well, that's kind of expected. So if you're watching the VOD, <laughs> which you might well be doing at this point in time. Now that's kind of a weird concept, isn't it? You're watching the VOD. And I'm talking to you in the future from the past. That's real weird. That is a real sort of weird mind bender, is that? Um, but yes. So when you when you're streaming, it can be quite difficult to sort of um, maintain a conversation with yourself. 
what I'm doing now. Obviously, there's a bright red one in here. I don't know if you can see it. it stands out, <laughs> doesn't it? <laughs> Let me lift that one. Out. A nice red colour, mind, but uh, I don't want it. Right, and a cup of tea before we go another bit further on this. It's going to be interesting to see after this stream whether anybody's actually even dropped in on the stream. So if you're watching in the future, welcome. Thank you for dropping in. Thank you for taking a look at the VOD or, or here on Twitch or even on YouTube. I suppose I could say here on Twitch or here on YouTube, couldn't I? Uh, because this will be available on YouTube 24 hours after we started the stream. Oh. Yeah, 20, it could be 24 hours. Because that's what the contract says. So if you want to see any of the old stuff, or indeed, I'd say old stuff, old as in previous broadcasts. But there's a lot of, uh, in, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff. So if you're interested in carving or pyrography or any of the other things that I do, uh, all the old broadcasts where I did them, I have available on YouTube. Guess where? YouTube.com slash Saraganart. And uh, you can watch things like the carving of Amber the Owl, or the pyrography of the leopard, or the lion, or Salute to Sunset, which is a very old, I say very old, two, two and a half years old now, Ace is that, pyrography, the African savannah. Um, they are available to watch, although they are, they are real-time. Pyrography real-time, don't get fooled by what you might see on the internet, does not take 20 minutes. Uh, at least not the, um, the fully shaded type of art that I do in pyrography. That um, takes tens or hundreds of hours to do. And so in real time, um, it's uh, quite a few streams worth, like 10 or 15 streams worth at the very least. Um, so it does take a while. Actually that is one use for uh, overclocking the PCs when I tr come to try and time lots lapse that down. Because that is something I want to try and be able to do, is to, to take all the pyrography items and run them in time lapse. So, yeah, 20 hours becomes 20 minutes. I have no idea how hard it is to, well, you, maybe you do, to find um, a video editing program that will uh, take or compress video that much. I mean, it's, it's almost, and I don't know if it's true, but it's kind of like taking, well, it, it probably would be, wouldn't it? An hour of video is 60 minutes, uh, a minute of video is 60 seconds. So if I wanted to, to take uh, 20 hours and compress it down to 20 minutes, that is one frame per minute. Ish. Hmm. So that's that's a rate of um, that's only sixty times, isn't it? So one hour will be one minute. Yeah. It's only a factor of sixty. It's not very much. And yet we, well, I'm, I'm using Adobe Premiere Elements. Um, that's that's doing things like. Talking, it's talking about things like 3,000% speeded up, or slowed down, speeded up, I suppose. Um, so one frame in the place of, 
Yeah, I suppose it is, isn't it? I mean, I'm thinking one frame is the um, 50 frames per second. And uh, there's 3,600 seconds times 50. So that's 180,000 frames, of which we take one. So yeah, that's one, that's one heck of a lot of um, percentage increase. Um, yeah, finding a video program that will let me do that is quite difficult. Uh, Premiere Elements is the only one I've found so far that will actually let me uh, put 20 hours of video on the timeline and say I want it 20 minutes long. For anything else, what I'd end up having to do is take the clip, or you know, the, the, the two hours of video, compress that down to about two minutes, say encode that, and save it, and then keep doing that, and then bond all those together, which would encode it a second time, which I don't like doing. I don't like in double encoding like that. Um, Oh, I'd have to encode, the, uh, encode them, but into a lossless format, and then bring them back, and then you know, edit the thing twice, which is you know, even more time-consuming. Something I ought to find the time to do, of course, because people don't really want to watch. But I'm sure you're the same. I uh, don't really want to watch 20 hours of video on YouTube. You have to be really interested in the subject to do that. It's not bad watching 20 hours when you're there in person and you're doing it two hours at a time in a stream. But uh, sat there watching a VOD afterwards, um, recorded video afterwards. Uh, you've got to be dedicated to do that. Although I would hope that um, you learn enough in doing that from watching my videos that it's worth doing, but anyway. Yeah, a ring light would be really nice because I keep moving into the shadow of this camera. The ring light on that one won't be so bad as well, but my face isn't because of the light reflecting off of this. I'm reasonably well lit. I'm going to have to look at my own video back to see what it looks like when I'm looking at the camera because I've got anything behind.
So, at this moment in time, I am thinking about perhaps finishing it early this evening. And completing one or two other things that I need to do. Which will give me a little bit more time. I think I might do that indeed. So, for those of you that may be watching, if you'd like to see any of the things again that you may have missed, there is of course two weeks worth of videos here on Twitch. But as I mentioned earlier, you can also see things on youtube.com slash out. Um, some of the crafts that I do here on uh, the stream are things like jewellery making. So I'm making things like chainmail bracelets, like these. And um, beadwork and things like that. Those are available in the shop. So if you'd like to take a look at those, I think some of them are really beautiful. Uh, then you can take a look at saraganart.etsy.com where the shop's shop is and you can see some things there. And there's also my own website saraganart.com where there is a little bit of uh, work in progress but it is it explains some of the crafts that I do and uh, some of the uh, art that's being created or the pieces that have been created it explains a little bit more about the sort of why they were done or what the idea was behind them. So I think that's a, a useful, interesting place uh, if you have time to take a look. And, and of course, of course. Um, Twitter is a good uh, good place to follow. Zaragonat, zaragonat.com Zaragonat.com is my own website. Uh, Twitter.com slash Zaragonat uh, because I tweet when I go live, for example, and if there's a problem with me going live, there's a fault I'm late I'm going to be late I can't make it that's where I'll do it I'll tweet it and also Facebook as well um, that gets more lengthy updates of course and uh, a few pictures so a good good thing if you want to keep up with Zaragon Art is to look out for the page on uh, Facebook as well of course facebook.com slash Zaragon Art and if you'd like to support the channel to help with things like buying the materials that are used in the art or the tools or indeed uh, broadcasting equipment like the ring light <laughs> then of course there's the two buttons at the top of the uh, top of the window here the bits button and the uh, uh, subscription button uh, proceeds of which go towards these things I've just mentioned if you'd like to see the stream tomorrow night I maybe carrying on with this or I may be doing some needle stabby things uh, then hopefully I'll be live from approximately 7 p.m. UK time that's GMT at the moment same as UTC you'll need to do the maths for your own time zone but hopefully that's uh, or ask Google of course or even ask the Amazon version of the Google speaking voice whose name I'm avoiding saying so she doesn't wake up I'll tell you the uh, the time zone, and um, I try and start as soon after 7 p.m. UK as I can. But things like evening meals sometimes cause that to be a little bit delayed. So don't worry, I will usually be there at some point. And with that, I hope I'll see you on the next stream. Bye for now.